introduce the uh, CO2 CIS programs uh, and then we'll try some some demonstrations to see how good. So how, how many of you here are have used the CO2 CIS in some form or another? Ooh, okay, about half or maybe a little more than half. Well, this will be fun. But you all have some version of it, right? Okay, well, so hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see. So the, the goal here is to try and understand how this program works. As, as Andrew mentioned, the carbonate calculations are, are somewhat complicated. Uh, some things cannot even be solved explicitly. Uh, so uh, we luckily have these programs. When I first started doing this work in the early 1990s, uh, I think Andrew had a program that he didn't really share, and, and Frank had his, Frank Malero had his program that he used. The rest of us were just kind of floundering around trying to figure it out on our own. You add on top of that the fact that, that almost all of the papers have some sort of typo in them <laughs> that is enough to just kill you. I, I really have to give a lot of credit to Ernie Lewis. He spent years very carefully going through all of those papers and figuring out all the typos and documented all of that. And it was a tremendous amount of work. He spent 10 of those hours just talking to me on the phone. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. So uh, anyway, he's saved. He's, he's the one we can all thank for uh, the fact that we can do this now. Um, anyway, so the, what I'd like to do is just kind of introduce you to the basics of the programs because they're uh, it, it makes a lot of things easier, but there are still some little pitfalls and things that you can do incorrectly in doing those calculations if you don't understand how they work that can uh, ultimately give you uh, wrong, wrong answers. So there, there are at least three versions of the CO2 CIS program. Uh, the, the first one is, is the executable that was uh, written by Ernie Lewis back in 1998. Uh, it's, it's, very, it's, it's very nice for doing, if you want to know, you know, oh, I've got total CO2 and alkalinity, what's the pH? If you want to do just a quick one-off calculation or a try a little experiment, this, this is actually probably the fastest and easiest way to do that. It does have a batch mode, and in the beginning, this is what we were using, but um, I personally find the Excel macros much more convenient for doing multiple numbers, multiple calculations. The nice thing too with the, with the macros uh, in Excel is that, for me at least, it provides a nice documentation of, of what I've done. Because I'll, I'll do a calculation and then, you know, you, you put the answer over here and they go, wow, how did I do that again? <laughs> so it allows you to, you can go back and do that. So there's uh, a couple of versions of this. There's a PC version and a Mac version. And actually, I, is, is there a Unix version? I don't know. But uh, yeah, there's a PC and a Mac version anyway. And you can get those from uh, CDAC. That, so that was done in 2006. Shortly after that, uh, this guy Greg Peltier and in uh, Washington Department of Ecology wrote a different version of this that, that um, I think is a little more intuitive and simpler. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you each of these and uh, tell you how they work. Um, but the other nice thing with, with this version is it's got some additional constants in there for doing calculations in low salinity waters which, uh, as Andrew nicely explained earlier, is changes those apparent solubility constants. So first, let's, and I'm gonna, I decided to start them up from scratch. So if you have a, a fairly new computer, there's some things you got to be aware of. So let, let's start with the CO2 CIS program. I hope you can see this. Uh, again, this is just a compile. All you have to do is Download the executable onto your computer and it should run. It opens up a little window like this. 
Um, there's kind of information here. I actually saw Ernie, he's still around. He, he's now doing uh, nuclear work at Brookhaven. But, uh, oops. So you hit P to go into the program. So the first thing you want to do is it, it has a series of default, yeah, I guess we do have to go with the lights off. There's a series of default choices here. And at the time that Ernie wrote this program, uh, it seemed like the favored constants at that time were the Roy et al. constants. They were the latest and greatest. Um, since then, we've uh, just determined that uh, Roy is, is maybe not the best, at least for most of the surface calculations. It seems Roy might be good for deep cold water calculations, but at least for most of what we do, we tend to use the um, Mehrbach constants as refit by Molero. So to change that, you would uh, select two. This shows you all the different constants, and the one that we typically use is four here which is the Mehrbach et al. is refit by Dixon and Malero 87. Uh, you can also choose what pH scale you're on. Um, there, there are a couple of different constants for, uh, for the sulfate. Uh, since Andrew's here, we'll use Andrew's. <laughs> um, you can also, it's, you also want to make sure that you're using FCO2 or PCO2, or at least you know which you're doing, right? So PCO2 is the partial pressure of the CO2 gas. F is the fugacity. Basically, it's the fugacity accounts for the fact that CO2 is not an ideal gas. It's, it's a small difference, but, um, but important and uh, we'll actually get into that uh, later when we start doing the actual exercises. There, so in this program you can do, as Andrew mentioned, there are four measurable carbon parameters. So these are the basically all the different pairs uh, that you can choose. So we'll do, we'll do one. It has defaults, but you can type in whatever you want. So if the salinity is, say, 34 instead of 35. Uh, it, it includes corrections for phosphate and silicate. Now, the, the, both, all these programs that you'll see have, uh, here's, here's one of the, the biggest stumbling blocks that people mess up on. There are input parameters, temperature and pressure, and there are output temperature and salinity, and pre blah, blah, input temperature and pressure. There, it depends on which parameter you're using, whether this matters or not. So the, the, best, the best thing to do is to, is to really use what you are intending. So if you measured pH, if you were doing pH in alkalinity, for example, or let's say if you were doing total CO2 in alkalinity, as Andrew mentioned, those are independent of temperature and pressure. So in that case, it doesn't matter. But if you were doing pH or PCO2, both of those are a function of temperature and pressure. So if you, uh, if you measured pH at, say, 25 degrees, and that's the value that you're entering, you have to use that as your input. But if you want to know what it w was in situ, then your output would, be, uh, you need to enter the in situ temperature because those parameters are going to uh, change depending on the temperature. And uh, I'll, when we go to our examples, I'm going to have an example of that. But uh, anyway, so you can just type in those. We'll use the defaults. Here's the output. It gives you a whole bunch of information. You have to, in this particular program, you have to kind of search around for, for what you want. But here's the, the values at the input conditions. And now in this case, I use 20 
and zero for both, so the input and the output are the same. But here, here are the input conditions and here's the output conditions. It breaks down all the different components that ultimately contribute to the alkalinity. It, it gives you the different distribution of the carbon species that contribute to the total inorganic carbon at the input and output conditions. Oops. Uh, it gives you FCO2 and PCO2, XCO2. All right, so here's, this is another general, um, generally when we're presenting FCO2 and PCO2, both of those are usually reported in wet air, okay, at 100% humidity. And the, the reason for that is because typically we're trying to calculate the air-sea gas exchange and the, what you're worried about is that exchange very close to the air-sea interface and we just, we assume that that water, that that air is 100% saturated with water vapor. But typically what we measure is XCO2, that's the mole fraction of CO2, and we typically measure that in dry air. So we remove that water vapor, and that, that can be a, a significant correction, as you can see here, that when you remove that water vapor, but you keep the total pressure the same, then the uh, fraction of CO2 increases, right? It uh, gives you the Ravel factor. Again, this is uh, nice. That's something that can't be explicitly calculated, but it does a nice little iterative routine that calculates that, and it gives you the saturation state for aragonite and calcite. Uh, it gives you the various pH in several of the different scales and pKs. All right, so that's so those that's what you get with an E to end. So that's the uh, executable that you can get get from CDAC. The next one we'll look at is yeah. Did you want to just comment on the gas flows for that one? I don't know if people are still using that. What do you mean the on? Gas input mode for the ASC station. What about it? Oh, just show it. Oh, yeah, so the, the way that you use the batch mode, again, I, I typically use the Excel now, is that you create a, a, a text file um, with, with information in a certain format and it tells you and then you can read that in and, and it spits it out. Um, so this, this is the original version of the Excel macro. My concern with this one is, um, well, there's a, a couple of things. One is there are these tabs on the bottom and many of, many of us, at least I know, I tend to forget that there are multiple pages. If you want to change the constants, you have to go to a different tab. You have to tab to this input and select which constants you want. Oh, oh, sorry. The, the other thing, this is why I wanted to, to start. If you're on a PC, on a new PC, at least using 2007, it automatically disables the macros. Both of these use macros. So you'll get this warning sign up here, and you have to go up to Options and select Enable this content if you want it to work. And I always forget that part. That's why. Anyway, so now once you've enabled the macros, now you can see all the different constants. Now at least this one defaults to uh, what we think, it, actually the, there are a newer set of constants called, that Tim Luker put out that I think uh, JP will talk about. Um, those are not in this, so the best we've got are the Merbach, which are pretty close. And again, same, same choices for sulfate. You can choose your seawater scale. And what you do here now is you can just type in the Things dying. You can type in your input conditions here, and you want to leave the you want to leave the so, so these are your input conditions. These are your output. Again, remember the temperature and pressure 
There's a difference between your input and your output. And then you just type in whichever parameters, two parameters you've got and leave the other two blank in this case. So if you've got alkalinity and total CO2, you type those in there and leave these blank. If you have alkalinity and PCO2, you type those in and leave the others blank. And then you hit this red button. It's not totally obvious, but you would hit this, this red start, start, start button here. Well, let's try one. So if we do a salinity of 35, temperature of 20, pressure zero, uh, won't put any nutrients in. Let's do output at five degrees, alkalinity of 2300, and a total CO2 of 1900. And then we hit start. Oops. It asks you all these questions. I don't know why, because I always just say yes. So then here are the results. Now the thing to note here is, notice the, these are the results at the input conditions. They're the first thing you're going to see. But if you're actually interested in the results at the output, you got to scroll way over to the right. So these are all still the input things to over to here. So what, what I find is that a lot of times I'll do the calculations and then you see, oh, well, there's the answer. But that's the answer only at the input conditions. You got to remember to scroll way over to the right to get the answers at the output conditions. So Watch out for that. A pressure of zero, yes, is. Yeah, an oceanographic convention says it. Yeah, that's uh, just. Chris? Yes. There's, uh, yeah, there's the typical Excel limits that, yeah, it's, it's a pretty big number. They have a 2007, it's, I don't know, my computer tends to crash before, <laughs> actually, or at least not, it, it'll sit there and it'll calculate all day. All right, so again, this is, this is the new one. So this, this one actually is my favorite. Now there, notice that we're, we're on version 14. If you go to the Department of Ecology website now, if you just do a search on CO2 cis, you'll see a link to the Department of Ecology, Washington State Department of Ecology, and you'll download that. This is version 14. There are other versions floating around out there. Um, most of them, I think, at least from 12 on are okay. I don't know about the early ones, but Anyway, the one you want is 14. Again, you have to enable the macros for it to work. Now on this one, the, the nice thing I like about this one is everything's all on one page. So you don't have to remember to go to the other tab to change the constants. They're, they're shown right here. So if you, uh, and you can it's got the little info that tells you what the different constants are, but if you click on it, you get a little arrow, and then you can select whichever constants you want. You can choose between uh, PCO2 and FCO2. You can change the pH scale. All those sort of things are, are up here. Now, the tricky thing with this one, they all have their little quirks. <coughs> um, the tricky thing with this one is, is are the inputs. So this, these are all the, the input sections. It only has two columns for input. If you go up and it, it, so right now it's defaulted to alkalinity and total carbon, which are shown here. What you will find, the, the tricky 
thing with this one is if you change it to, let's say, alkalinity and FCO2, you notice that this header didn't change. But this actually now is looking for FCO2, not total carbon. <laughs> so if you have total carbon in there and it's set to FCO2, it's going to go, wait a minute, that's not right. Get what you pay for. <laughs> <laughs> I say they all have their little quirks. So um, now once it, once it updates, all right, so let's, uh, so let's do, and the nice thing, with this one also has a nice ID. The other one didn't have a, an ID uh, column. So let's, what are we doing? Our salinity of 35, 0, 0, 20, 0, 5, 0. Now I put it on... TA and FCO, so let's do 2300 and uh, 387. Now you go back and this run button is what makes it work, hopefully. So there's the cal calculation. Now this one has the same issue that first You'll say at least they're color coded though. That helps me anyway. These are all the, the input things. So it, oh, and you'll notice that once you hit the run, then it changes the title. So if you screwed it up, at least then uh, afterwards you can look at it and go, oh, well, it says FCO2. And the order of those columns is always the order that's that's shown up here. So you'd have to put alkalinity first and FCO2 second. Just, yeah, you get what you pay for. They all have their little issues. Yeah, so these are the, and I don't know, to me it's just a little simpler. So these are the output conditions and these are the input conditions. All right, so. Well, r remember the, uh, the EXC program gave you all kinds of stuff. Most of that is not, not all of that is in the Excel spreadsheets, the PKs and the, the uh, errors. And so if you want all those sort of details, you have to go back to the EXC. This gives you, sorry, I just closed it. It gives you the distribution of the carbon species. It gives you the other carbon parameters. It gives you the saturation states. It gives you the Revell factor. Um, the stuff that 90% of the time we use is... is oh, sorry. Um, no. The, oh, I didn't... Well, I can... The, the, diff, the main difference is the, the, the look of it and you know how they work but the other thing is the this version has in it the um, a couple of extra so it has this this Malero 79 I, I don't recall whether that one but it the Kai and Wang uh, constants are in here and yeah so there's there's a few extra constants particularly for low salinity waters that are not in the other Excel spreadsheet or in the executable all right so you guys ready to try some some calculations uh-huh yes N 
you, you, can't, you can't actually, the, it will only calculate using two. Whichever two it comes up with first are the ones that it will, so if you have, if you measured three things, and as Dick Andrew said, those three things are not completely internally consistent, uh, it's, it's only going to give you an answer based on the first two pair that it comes across. You have to do two separate calculations. But you miss out the one problem. The problem you've got is that if you use all, one way to use all three and not confuse yourself is to throw out one of the equilibrium columns. Because then you get the same, the right number of parameters to, to solve uniquely a set of equations. And the formula using sets of three and four variables are not included. Yeah, that, that's actually another reason why I like the 14 because it's very clear that you cannot do three. Whereas in the other one, you think you can do three, but it's not actually doing three. <laughs> All right, so uh, what I th thought I'd try for an experiment, let's do our first calculation. Uh, the reference materials that you're going to be using during the ne next two weeks are based on batch 98. And these are the properties that Andrew uh, sent me for that batch. And, but he only certifies for alkalinity and total carbon. <clears throat> so my question is, what is the pH and the FCO2 of those waters at these, under these conditions? So, Go ahead and do your calculations. If you have any problems, raise your hand or let us know. We could maybe turn up the lights for this part <laughs> so you can see your keyboards. Everybody done? No. no. So notice that I'm doing, I'm asked for pH on the total scale. And I've asked for FCO2, not PCO2. So make sure you, uh, So we've got, well, I'm glad, it looks like the PCs are dominating here. Yeah, they are. That's good. Yeah, oh, sorry, yes. Use the, uh, the Mehrbach constants and the uh, Dixon okay. sulfate. Don't worry, the sulfate won't matter. No. All right, who's done? Raise your hand. Not very many people raising their hands. All right, so here's, this should be your answer, or this, this may be rounded off depending on, uh, on which, what your Excel Yeah, that's what that means. So, so did everybody get that same answer? You didn't get for FCO2? What, what did you get? 0. 0.5? I'm on total scale. Yeah. 
You sure you got the temperature and the salinity? And All these input parameters are the same. What, which version are you using? The, the one from CDAC. I thought I checked it on both, or on all three. We've got, I don't know, we'll, how about we'll come back, Hernan, and see. All right, let's go on to the next one because we've got a lot to cover. All right, so now let's say that you open that CRM in the lab that has a PCO2, a PCO2 of 387 microatmospheres. You took out an aliquota sample because you were uh, using it to, to calibrate or to check your calibration on your SOMA or whatever. An hour later, you take out another aliquot to analyze from that same bottle. What do you expect the DIC of that new aliquot to be? And we're going to assume that the CRM has equilibrated with the lab air. Anybody know how you would do that? All right, so everything's the same. So we know that, that alkalinity is not affected by gas exchange, right? So we can use the same alkalinity. The alkalinity of the CRM won't have changed. But now we don't know what the total CO2 is. Remember from this, from our result, we calculated that the CO2 of the water sample was 447.8. That's much higher than the lab. So as soon as you open that bottle, CO2 is going to start coming out of the bottle and the DIC is going to change. So what we do <coughs> is you say the alkalinity is not going to change. You're not going to have significant evaporation or anything during that, that hour. But the PCO2 now we set to equivalent to the lab air, which is 387. And then we calculate, so we use inputs of alkalinity and PCO2 and calculate what the total CO2 is. So let me know when you get that answer. It, yes, and, and in reality it would take mo much more than an hour for it to, but, but uh, we're going to take an extreme. What you're going to see is it's a big change. Right, 387 is, is the outside, clean, pristine uh, air right now. But I wanted to make a big, but I wanted to make a big difference, so. I'm trying to make a point here. Yeah, Andrew's got a whole lecture on that. All right, everyone have that calculation? Hopefully you got something like this. So the, the total CO2, given my uh, low lab air and my fast equilibration, would come to 1986. So that's a change of 27 micromoles. Now admittedly, that's, you're not going to get a full exchange over that time period. And your lab air, if you're breathing in there, is probably uh, a bit higher than, than outside. But that's a big change. And so that brings me to my, my one of the things that we need to watch out for when you're doing these experiments. Basically, as soon as you open a reference material, that they're all pretty high PCO2. So as soon as you open them, they're going to start to lose CO2. Um, so I would say unless you're going to analyze them one right after the other, but even if you do that, we've found that we can see a difference between the first run on a CRM and the second run. Be very cautious about running used CRMs for DIC. Good idea to load them into syringes with uh, a little low 
potentially if you if you need to use them multiple times, but you know. Oh, sorry. Certified reference material. Andrew here bottles up seawater that have been analyzed and certified to have a, a known alkalinity and, and total CO2 concentration. You can buy those. So what we do is when we're running our instruments, uh, we will run a reference material and hopefully we get the, the certified answer, but if we don't, then at least that's a common reference that every, all the different labs are all analyzing and we all know what we are relative to what Andrew th says it is. Right. Well, it, it also depends on, like, the somas that I've got, the original soma design, the way that pushes sample, the way that draws sample out is that it, it pushes a head gas, headspace gas, into the bottle. What you're doing there is you're pressurizing the sample, and particularly if you use, like, a nitrogen with, uh, headspace gas, which has zero CO2, you push that into the bottle, that's going to enhance the exchange. And, and I say, we've, we've found that even running w one right after the other after a, a, after a 30 minute run, that we can see differences. Yeah. Right, right, right. So it loses, it loses CO2. Now you can fix that. You can have a, a headspace gas that's some higher concentration of CO2, and and sometimes we do that to try and minimize that exchange. But all right, so let's let's move on. Um, Right, good. Now, I'm sorry, I don't mean to, I just have a couple more examples I want to try. So now let's take a look at a, at a deep North Pacific sample. It's got these following properties, um, but in this hypothetical scenario, you also collected a, a CO2 sample that you want to uh, analyze for discrete FCO2. 
so what do you think the in situ FCO2 will be or was when you collected it and actually when you bring the sample up you collected it and you're analyzing it on the ship at that point you have warmed it up to 20 degrees so you actually are analyzing the sample at 20 degrees so the question is what what's the the FCO2 that you're actually going to measure <coughs> and what was it in situ So at this point, I'm going to assume you know how to enter things into your spreadsheet properly. Now notice that in this case, we've got phosphate and silicate. The in situ temperature is 1.55, but the analysis temperature is 20 degrees. So here's where we're getting into that input temperature, output temperature. Make sure you get them right or you're going to get a really wacky answer. Uh, don't worry. Typically, actually, it, 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 most of them are expecting meters. Um, yeah, so just use that. It's, it's, it says, sorry. <laughs> uh, that's a great question. I don't think the spreadsheets can handle that. Yeah, you'd have to you'd have to convert one or the other to the other's temperature. It's a good question. All right, we ready? So what's, what's, what's the in situ FCO2? So the, in, hopefully you guys got this answer. So the in situ FCO2 is 608.8 .8 microatmospheres, but what you actually measured was 1,350 microatmospheres. PCO2 is, is, or FCO2 is very strongly affected by temperature. So as you warm in, in a fixed closed container, if you warm the temperature of the water, if you increase the temperature of the water, the, the CO2 will increase by about 3% for each degree that you warm it. <coughs> so what you're actually measuring is quite a bit larger than the in situ. And this is the problem, this is an issue with measuring uh, discrete PCO2s from the water column is even though you can measure this value reasonably well with the instrument, what you ultimately want to know is what's the in situ value. And you can see that, that that's a huge correction to make. So any uncertainty in how you correct back for this uh, is going to introduce errors into your term. Also, when you're collecting this sample, that's significantly higher than atmospheric CO2. So any exchange or leak or contamination you get is going to strongly affect the PCO2. And so it's very, very difficult to measure discrete PCO2s from inside the water column. All right. Now, one last calculation I want you to do. Let's do that same calculation, but let's assume that you don't know the nutrient concentrations. A lot of time the nutrient guys are, you know, they collect their samples and then they sit around for hours while we're <laughs> slaving away, <laughs> while we're slaving away trying to make our carbon measurements and they go, oh, I haven't even started yet. I want to watch a movie first. <laughs> And then, like five minutes before the next cast, you go, oh, well, I better run all my samples real quick. <laughs> so a lot of times when we're doing our, our measurements, we don't actually have the nutrient values available right now. So let's, let's go back and here I'll go. So here they are again, except this time 
put your phosphate to zero and your silicate to zero and see if that makes a difference in your calculations. All right, everybody done? So here's what I got, at least, with uh, the nutrients set at zero. So the, at uh, in situ temperature,